Hello everyone, thank you very much for watching this video in which we discuss version 0.1.0 of the new experimental authorization server from Spring. Uh, this version has just been released a couple of weeks ago and we have some nice features added uh, together with it like the OpenID Connect Core, uh, the OpenID Connect Discovery, uh, uh, first implementation of course of this and the possibility of adding headers and claims uh, customize your JWT token. Uh, of course, there are more than these three. These are just the say, most important that have been noted on the first page. But if you go into the detailed release notes, you will, have that, you will see that plenty of features and bug fixes have been added to this um, version since the previous release. So I encourage you go through all of them, test them. And if you find something, you find a bug or something that's not working as you expected, report it to the team and why not solve it uh, by yourself and contribute to this excellent project. Um, with the, today's video, I will go uh, through the main things uh, and the changes in the syntax. Remember that this project is not uh, mature yet, it's still an experimental version. That means you cannot use it in production yet. I still see this confusion. I know starting with version 2.4 of Spring Boot, you cannot use at all the Spring Security uh, OAuth projects. So you, you now have absolutely no way of implementing an authorization server. Uh, but of course, uh, the idea is you still have to learn how Spring Security OAuth works, especially because there are chances you will find it in existing projects that will not necessarily upgrade to a version uh, above 2.4 of Spring Boot. Uh, I, I already know some, some uh, projects uh, that won't do that soon because of costs, of course. Uh, and um, I know that you still cannot use the new experimental server um, uh, feature in production because it's not mature yet. So uh, at the moment, um, uh, backwards compatibility is not granted. And of course, it's not complete yet. You don't have plenty of features. It's something we, that, that we'll be implementing following the next months. Uh, it's really important to, to know that because I see confusion uh, still happens and uh, there are developers still asking uh, for documentation or how can they use this in production and the answer is no, you cannot use it in production even though you don't have an alternative. If you want to implement uh, your authorization server, you either go for a third party solution like Keycloak or you use a version, um, uh, you use, uh, use the Spring Security OAuth with a Spring Boot version under 2.4. Now, with that being said, let's uh, go to the implementation and I have prepared here a project for you. I made it as simple as possible. Uh, I, I won't take uh, again line by line all the implementations because I have already discussed this uh, for in, in the past three videos. Uh, so if, if you feel completely uh, unaware of what the things I will present are, I do recommend you um, first watch also the Spring Security playlist uh, on my uh, YouTube channel. Uh, and uh, also um, this video is part of a playlist where I discuss uh, each version that is released of the new Spring Security Authorization Server. So you might want to see uh, how the project progressed since uh, version 001 and you find a video for each of uh, the implementations. So I, I won't go through all the capabilities of uh, the existing version because that would mean discussing too many things and probably uh, the video will become too long. But uh, because I have re uh, recorded um, um, video for each version, you find uh, for each version uh, detailed precisely the most important um, things that have been added with that specific version. So what you can do if you feel you need more help is going um, back to those videos in, in the playlist for the new experimental authorization server and you will, you will find out uh, um, all the things that have been added, uh, including the how to uh, use the grant types, uh, the implemented grant types, which are now authorization code and the client credentials and the refresh token and, uh, and stuff like that, that um, has been added with the previous uh, version. So now I will directly discuss uh, version 010. Uh, 
to make it really clear, I have a Maven project here. Uh, mind that if you use the samples uh, from um, uh, the GitHub project, from, from the official project, the official samples are with Gradle, which is not a problem, of course. Uh, I do prefer my Maven, so I, I um, uh, created my uh, projects using Maven from the very beginning. In the POMXML file, I only have three dependencies. One is the Spring Boot web dependency because of course this is a web application so I do need the web capabilities. Second, I have uh, the, uh, the Spring Security dependency because of course we uh, do secure our application here so we use um, contracts and classes and capabilities provided by the Spring Security dependency. And of course we are discussing impl the implementation of the new authorization server so I have uh, added to my POMXML file version 010 uh, of the new experimental again yet authorization server that hopefully soon will be mature enough to use it in production as but not at the moment. Okay so these are the dependencies uh, that you need to implement an authorization server using the new experimental authorization server and then of course just want to show you this is just a uh, a main class uh, containing no other annotation and nothing special about it. I prefer using my configuration annotations on configuration classes. So the full code of my project is basically here where you see the configuration class uh, annotated with the standard spring configuration annotation and you also see the fact that I as in the previous projects as in the previous videos for the, the uh, version 001, 002 and 003, uh, I don't have Spring Boot providing me yet uh, with uh, pre-configuration. Uh, it doesn't have a convention yet for this project because this project is not mature yet. So you have to import yourself the OAuth authorization server configuration, uh, which is as simple as adding the import annotation over the class. Now, I uh, try to minimize uh, if, uh, if you um, use the sample provided by the uh, Spring Security Authorization Server project, you will see a little bit more things in the configuration. I try to minimize my example to make it as easier to understand as possible. First of all, uh, I'd like to show you that um, uh, it's uh, possible now to use the security filter chain configuration instead of extending the web security configurer adapter class, uh, which is basically the way we did in most of the applications up to now uh, when we wanted to configure the authorization, the, the endpoint configurations and of course some, some other configurations we were if you remember extending the web security configurer adapter class uh, and uh, we were uh, overriding the configure method using uh, the HTTP security as a parameter and then we were able to do the configurations. Now uh, a better approach is of course uh, uh, being um, completely decoupled from different classes like the web security configurer adapter and simply using uh, contracts like security filter chain uh, by the means of adding uh, only a bin to our um, uh, context which is a very very clean approach and is the same approach I was telling you to use with and I, I taught you how to use uh, in my Spring Security play playlist with the user detail service, with the password encoder uh, as well uh, and with other, other um, configurations uh, you might need to use depending on what you implement. So um, we have of course uh, it, if you read the, um, the configuration here, it's nothing uh, extraordinary, it's not, nothing out of ordinary. I'm just using here uh, the uh, HTTP authorized requests to uh, have all the requests authenticated. So I'm using uh, the any request matcher method, uh, which refers to absolutely any, any request. And by using the authenticated method afterwards, uh, I uh, configure everything to need authentication and then because we will be going we, we are going to use um, the uh, authorization code grant type we need our authorization server to provide a way for the user to authenticate so I'm simply using the form login here 
which is for an example the simplest approach we can take. The phone login will be automatically presented to the user, the user will be able to um, uh, authenticate and uh, after a successful authentication uh, the authorization server redirects the user uh, to um, the resource server using um, um, sorry it, it redirects the user to the client uh, with the authorization code uh, in the url i will show you the flow immediately you don't have to worry about it uh, and now of course i need a user detail service in a real world scenario that will be an implementation that takes the user de the details from a database or an ldap or an active directory um, I don't know, it, it's, uh, it basically manages somewhere the users. In the case of an example, you know already we are using uh, a simple in-memory implementation uh, just to have a user so we can test uh, everything we want to test. So I'm, I'm adding a dummy user here called user1 with the password password. Mind that I'm using the uh, default password encoder which is the no op password encoder and the method is striked out because this is something you should never use in a production application so it's only for examples it's marked as deprecated but not because it was ever used because this password encoder is an implementation that doesn't encode uh, anyhow the password uh, and of course, that's not something you want in any application. In any application, you must use a strong hashing algorithm to uh, encode your password so that if, if they are somehow stolen, they cannot be reverted to their inputs. But of course, in case of an example, to make our application simpler and uh, take out the complexity of a password encoder. We use the, new, the no op password encoder. The no op password encoder uh, doesn't encode the password, so I'm simply just writing the password in plain text. Then, if you have been watching the first three videos about the new authorization server, you already know that the registered client repository uh, is the definition of uh, the object that manages uh, the clients uh, in uh, the authorization server while the registered client re uh, represents one client uh, so of course in the in in a production application when this will be production ready uh, probably the client details will also be in a database or somewhere managed and then you will have an implementation of the registered client repository that will allow you uh, for example, take the client details from the database. Uh, for now, uh, like for the users, we will use an in-memory implementation and the in-memory implementation only contains one client so that we are able to test uh, the authorization server. The um, important things to note is uh, we have the client ID and we have the client secret again in plain text for simplicity reasons. Uh, we use basic authentication when we call the endpoints. I, I'm only adding as a grant type the authorization code, but mind as you have seen in the previous uh, examples uh, for version 001, 002 and 003, uh, you can also use uh, the um, client grant type. It has been implemented and you can use as well uh, the refresh token grant type. I'm not going into that again. Uh, all the uh, all the constants here for the implicit grant type and the password they are also here declared, but um, in this version they are not implemented yet. But for us, the authorization code grant type is enough for our demonstration. And by the way, the authorization code also works with Pixie. Um, and that's something I have proven how to do in the video for version 003 when uh, using Pixie was introduced uh, as well. Uh, then we have the redirect URI uh, and uh, this is the URI where we expect the authorization server redirects the um, uh, client, basically redirects the user through the client uh, once um, it has been um, uh, author, once it, it has been com uh, correctly authenticated and something new this comes with uh, version 010 is that we have the OIDC scopes and it's uh, given as um, a set of constants let's call it like this where you have 
all the defined all the all the scopes defined in the uh, open id specification so we have the open id profile email address and phones um, i do recommend you read the open id specification if you if you didn't do that yet it will um, of course i will show you some things here and i will prove you how the, this works but uh, i can't go through the full uh, uh, specification of open id uh, and um, uh, just to mention, OpenID is based on OAuth 2. So as I see uh, people again confusing, considering that OpenID and OAuth 2 are different things, uh, but they are not basically completely different things. Oh, uh, OpenID is something designed over OAuth 2. So that's why what you see here is still me uh, following the known uh, about the authorization code uh, flow just that I do use some specific scopes and uh, depending on what we refer to we have some changes in maybe requests and responses like for example you will see that in case of OpenID be um, besides having the access, access token you also have the ID token which is a a token that's not defined by the, the OAuth 2 specification but is um, added by the OpenID specification and this refers to um, um, details having a token that details the user. Uh, and then as uh, the um, OpenID specification um, uh, specifies you don't uh, need to only have scopes from OpenID, you might use other scopes. So I added, I added here read and write, which are not scopes from, uh, from OpenID Connect, just to prove that's possible to use this as well. Uh, then one other thing that has been added to version 010 is the possibility of having um, uh, disabling or enabling the user consent. Uh, and I will discuss this as well in this video. Uh, and basically this is the uh, client configuration we need. What you can add besides this is of course, you might have multiple redirect URIs if you'd like. You might use uh, also the client credentials or the refresh token. And I won't mention in this video, but I detailed in the previous one that, that you can also revoke the tokens uh, since version 003. And then uh, there is a change uh, on how to manage keys. Uh, so we had that key manager in um, uh, case of version 003 and previously, and I'm not sure uh, it should be written somewhere here that um, we don't use that anymore. They have been refactored uh, to uh, something else, something that I will show you now. I don't find it now, but you, you will be able to find it here as well. So let, let me go back and show you how the keys are managed now instead of having that key manager. You basically, I'm going from below, you basically generate the key pair. This is similarly to what you would have done with any kind of key pair, asynchronous key pair generation. This is something, some code that you you, uh, might be familiar already with if you have used asynchronous key pairs. It's something that I also prove in some other videos I have on this YouTube channel, as well as in the book I've written, Spring Security in Action. So we generate the key pair. And then from the key pair, we take both the public and the private key. Remember that the authorization server uses the private key to sign the tokens uh, in terms of JVT tokens while the public key is uh, used, uh, is exposed um, uh, by the um, uh, certificate endpoint um, and um, uh, it's consumed when needed by the resource server and used to validate that uh, the token has been indeed signed with that, uh, that specific private key. So we get this key pair in the end and what we do with it, we um, create a key source this is a key source uh, and here in the key source is like a manager for all the key pairs because in case of the authorization server you might have multiple key pairs and uh, when when i'm when i will show you the certificates and endpoint 
uh, you will uh, see that in my case I will only see uh, one key pair because that's what I've been added but in case you um, uh, add multiples you have the possibility of defining more key pairs that you use uh, for specific uh, tokens. Uh, of course, not, not everything is working now precisely as in the specification because if it would have worked already, then it would have, it would have been a mature version. But the idea is I will show you the progress mostly, so what it is working now. So this is an excellent addition because in the end, we uh, need to be able to manage the key pairs that are used by the authorization server. So this is an important addition and uh, a step forward in the implementation of the authorization server. Uh, so this is one of the biggest changes, which is, which is the key management. Uh, and uh, another big change and the last one in the, in the configuration um, uh, file is having the possibility to um, uh, define the provider settings which um, uh, allow us to specify the issuer but uh, they allow us to specify as well the uh, endpoints uh, the way we want them to look like and this is again something defined by the OpenID Connect specification. Uh, I will show you again how this works um, when I'm, um, I will now start the application and we will step by step uh, recreate the authorization code grant type uh, and then I will show different details that are related some of them I will, I will tell you which are related to the OpenID Connect which is uh, the part that has been implemented in 010 and what's different for example from uh, using um, uh, directly OAuth 2 without relying on uh, the above layer of OpenID Connect so let me start this application I should be able to start it now uh, this is the minimum documentation we have again, so this is basically the minimum we can add. Uh, but uh, the idea is that if you will take a look in for in the previous videos I, I uh, recorded, you will see that there are more features than the one I'm showing you now. I, I won't, I'm only showing you what's new in 010. And not only what's new, but what's most important from what's new, because you've seen there in the re release notes that there are actually uh, a lot of things and bugs that have been fixed uh, uh, so uh, um, it doesn't make sense to go through all the details, it's not relevant, but I want to show you at least what's very relevant. So my application is now started, it should be started on port 8080 because I didn't, uh, um, I didn't configure anything in the application properties, so it's the default port which is expected. And where can I go in my postman here? No, first I have to go in a browser of course, and I have to go in a browser and I have to uh, enter the um, uh, authorize endpoint. So I, I would say something like uh, HTTP localhost 8080 and it's about to authorize and then I have to specify the response type which is code the client ID which is client I think I'm going back to verify it's client of course uh, and then uh, let's see and the scope at least the scope it's needed here so I'm using the scope open ID in this case which is the scope one of the scopes I added this constant is basically open ID so I'm able to use open ID and then if I'm going like this I'm presented with uh, the nice login form that's why remember I've told you that's the reason why I added the form login authentication method here to allow the user to log in and then I'm logging in with the user itself user one and password so I need to say here user1 okay and password sorry didn't uh, and then what you see here is that I have an error message and this error message is now because I, I didn't specify in the URL uh, the uh, response type so you might be wondering why I'm showing you this is because in the previous videos 
uh, I was using this URI without the uh, redirect uh, without the redirect URI specification here and it was working and the reason it's not working now is because when you use the open ID you rely on the open ID specification where the redirect URI is mandatory so let's try to redo this and now say about to authorize client and redirect URI is and then let me copy it from my code because in my case I just added it like this in the code and it won't work so I'm now when because I already logged in the session was kept so if this was the first time it would have been presenting me again the uh, login form but I did already log in correctly I used the the right uh, credentials so I'm already authenticated so when I when I pasted pasted this I'm not presented anymore just because I did already authenticate but you can observe that now I did uh, I was indeed redirected correctly to my redirect URI and then I was also provided with my authorization code so from this point of view the authorization uh, server works correctly so I wanted to prove you first that indeed it now correctly um, implements the uh, OpenID specification and that's because in the OpenID specification the redirect URI is mandatory in the request and it should be equivalent with one of the redirect URIs that you have configured on the client because remember you can configure multiple redirect URIs so if I want I can just go and add multiple redirect URIs and then if you have multiple redirect URIs then when you specify it in the URL it should be one of those that you have configured and that will be precisely the one to which the authorization server uh, will redirect you after successful authentication so in my case because I was already authenticated on the session side uh, from the previous example uh, I was directly redirected to my redirect URI localhost 8080 authorized don't be worried that is not there it's not implemented it's just a demonstration I don't have to implement it I'm the uh, only important thing in terms of uh, the authorization server is that I was indeed correctly uh, redirected to that URL whether it exists or not and that I have been provided with the code which is the authorization code and I would like to take this authorization code copy it and go into my postman here where I would like first to generate a token and to generate a token we use of course the token endpoint uh, and the authorization code so HTTP localhost 8080 auth 2 token and then I have to say that I'm using the grant type authorization code so I'm still using again authorization code is, a defin is as is as it is defined by uh, the OAuth 2 framework specification again open id connect is something that is above OAuth 2 is not not replacing it uh, and then I need to specify the code okay uh, and I do also need to because I'm not using pixie as you can see here if I would have used pixie I, I needed to for from the very beginning um, create a verifier and um, uh, a token to to validate that uh, uh, the first uh, request is equivalent to the token generation is the same client as uh, for the token generation you can see a demonstration in um, the video for version 003 now for simplicity reasons I'm just going to use basic authentication see I have here specified I'm using basic authentication so that's why I, I specific uh, I, I specified basic authentication and here I say client and secret which are my credentials and then I send it and it says invalid grant and that's most likely because uh, the scope should be also specified not only uh, scope and redirect URI maybe 
because I'm in open ID here. So I'm going to take the redirect URI again and make sure that I add it as well. Okay, fantastic. So yes, see when I use when I'm using Open ID Connect, I'm a little bit more restricted. That that's basically what happens. The Open ID Connect specification adds some restrictions over OAuth2. Uh, OAuth2. If I was using OAuth2, then the addition of the redirect URI there wasn't mandatory. Uh, so that's why in the very the first uh, couple of calls I um, um, got uh, an error and I didn't get a successful response uh, because I was relying on less than what the OpenID Connect imposes. Now that I, I fulfilled the OpenID uh, Connect uh, specification, I'm getting, you can see, the access token and I'm getting a second token which is the ID token. If I would have used the refresh token, then I would have uh, been provided with a refresh token as well. But you see, I don't get a refresh token because, of course, I didn't uh, specify uh, the refresh token can be used by my client. But you see, indeed, I get the access token, which is part of the specification of the OAuth2 framework. And I get also the ID token, which is part of the specification of OpenID Connect. Let's take any of these and see that they are indeed valid JWT tokens. How do I do that? Usually I'm going into a browser and I very much like to go to JWTIO and that's to show you what's behind the scenes, uh, basically to show you what's inside this base64 encoding. You see the header and you see uh, the, the body as it has been generated, uh, which is clearly very simple and uh, is just uh, just for the demonstration, you see uh, only what's mandatory from the specification point of view. Uh, you don't see anything else, but remember that you can customize your token as well. Uh, now, one important thing we see here, the key ID. The key ID needs to be, in this case, uh, identifying precisely the pair, the key pair we have configured in our authorization server. So that means that if I'm going into my postman again, I should be able to call another endpoint using this time HTTP GET. So I'm not really used with my new computer yet, but it's not token, is the keys endpoint. And if I send this, then you see this, the keys is an open endpoint. I don't need authentication for it. And inside you have what we call the key set, which in terms of code is equivalent to what this bin provides. So this is the, the key set that is managed by the JW key source. And in, inside which, if you remember, we added our key pair, the one we generate just by calling these methods, as I presented in the beginning of the video. So that's why here we only see one key and the key ID of this key, C0, C8, something, something, should be precisely this one, C0, C8, that you can find in the header of your uh, access token uh, and the ID token. So this is uh, the, the demonstration in our case of using the new authorization server version 010 with OpenID Connect. You can clearly see that it uh, fulfills uh, correctly the OpenID specification up to now. Uh, I can prove you that it's working also without OpenID still. And for example, in this case, you see that I have a client, may maybe you didn't observe this, but I will tell you online, 65. I actually configured that the user consent is requested, but have you seen any user consent? No, when I, when I logged in, I, I haven't been asked about a user consent uh, and that's because uh, I'm using OpenID Connect and in the specification of OpenID Connect, uh, you will see that user consent is not required. So that's why even if my user consent is set on true, I'm not asked, I, I haven't been asked for the user consent because I've been using OpenID Connect. But if I'm going 
to a wow 2 standard and use one of these scopes then i should be re i should be asked for user consent as well so that's uh, that's an important difference we can try to do that as our next example but to uh, to save some time i'd also like to discuss uh, at the same time about the provider settings so the provider settings allow us to change some of the configuration for example here i can say uh, which is the easiest from here to change probably the jw key set endpoint so uh, in this case you can change the issuer as well as uh, the definition of some of the endpoints you'd like to use uh, like I will, the, for example, prove in this case, I want the uh, key send point to no longer be this one, JWKS, uh, but instead I'd like to be named certs. And if I remember correctly, this is basically the way uh, in which you find the endpoint in Keycloak, uh, but it's irrelevant. The idea is you can, you can change it to something else. So if I'm going now to stop and rerun this, uh, when I will be using the certs endpoint like this. Oh, sorry, it's only certs because I have configured it directly from the root like this. Yeah, you see basically the same thing you were previously seeing uh, with the default endpoint which was slash awauth2 slash wks, jwks. Uh, so this is a way, this is part of the, the implementation for version 0.1.0, the provider settings, uh, which enables us configure further our authorization server. And this is again an excellent addition uh, that, is, um, uh, that, that will help us configure the authorization server the way we'd like it to be in terms of the endpoints as well as the issuer. So uh, that's uh, another, another important feature that has been added to version 0.1.0. And then uh, maybe we, we want to take also the flow uh, using uh, the read scope. So I'm actually, I'm wondering Mind that I, I didn't test this, so this is the first time I'm working with it as well. Uh, I didn't have time to test this version. I'm usually testing the version and then I'm reporting the bugs. But now, uh, because I, I just received a, a question um, on uh, on YouTube, uh, I uh, said it's time to, even, even though I didn't uh, have the time to, to thoroughly look on it, uh, I wanted to test it together with you. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm, I'm testing it together with you. So if we find any bug, uh, we uh, I, I will basically uh, report it. Uh, hopefully I don't. Uh, so now let's see what I want to do here. It's about to authorize and then response type code client. And let me say I want to use read in this case, read. So I'm going here with read. I'm redirected to the login. I'm using user one and password and I'm now asked for the user consent. Do you see the difference? So when, I, when I've been using open ID here, I wasn't asked for, for the user consent. If I'm using some kind of scope that is not related to the open ID specification, which is possible, then I'm asked for consent for that. So I do submit my consent and then I'm getting the authorization code, which I can use further to call the token endpoint. Another observation, when I didn't, didn't use the uh, scope for OpenID, I haven't been asked for the redirect URI. I would have been asked for the redirect URI if I would have had multiple here, because I, if you have multiple, then you have to specify which one as a client you would prefer to be redirected to. Uh, so other, otherwise the server doesn't know which is the URI out of the multiple it has configured to which it needs to redirect you. But mind that in this case, uh, I wasn't uh, um, forced to use the redirect URI. So I, I, it, it worked, it gave me the um, code without uh, uh, needing to, to specify the redirect URI. And I, I should be able to do the same thing here. So code, now I have the new code and see that I will take out the redirect URI 
completely. So I should be able to put the code here, press the send button and it works without the redirect URI because now I'm not relying anymore on OpenID Connect specification. I'm relying on the OAuth2 directly, which is a little bit more relaxed than the OpenID specification. That's that's the whole idea. The, so the um, uh, OpenID configuration specification a little bit uh, takes out of the relaxation that is uh, defined by the OAuth2. So it, it has some more rules over the OAuth2. And of course, what you see is definitely the ID token disappeared because now I'm not using OpenID and the ID token is part of the OpenID specification. So that's why in the response, I only have an access token, which is as defined by the OAuth2 specification, but I don't have the ID token as you have seen previously. So that is that. And I think we have covered all the important things, all the, everything is important, of course, but the main things, the main features that I'd like you to be aware of uh, in terms of the new authorization server, hopefully, uh, which will become uh, as soon as possible, mature enough, so we will be able to use it in production. I'm very looking forward to that moment. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please let me know if you further have questions. Don't forget that the code is available on my GitHub account and the link to uh, the GitHub account uh, will be in the video description uh, and in the comment section. Um, and I will also leave you uh, the link for the uh, blog record on the Spring IO website. So maybe you can, um, you would like to take a look yourself on the release notes and the descriptions of the features and the bug fixes. And again, I encourage you to further contribute to the project and maybe to uh, other open source projects as well. We need people working on open source uh, and uh, I, I really hope uh, many developers will understand that. Um, that being said, thank you very much again. Keep uh, in touch with you on LinkedIn, Twitter and YouTube uh, and um, keep on the good work and have a nice time for learning further. Cheers.